Good morning. Welcome to our chapel forum this morning. Good to all be together. Um, so it is the year of Matthew coming up. Why is it the year of Matthew? Because we have what's called a lectionary. Folks familiar with that term? A lectionary? Somewhat familiar? That we have a lectionary because if we didn't, you would just get to hear each pastor's five favorite passages over and over and over and over again. Or we would have Bible passages read in church that are really dictated by whatever the worship leaders happen to think is the issue of the day that needs to be addressed. The lectionary provides us with a steady and dependable coverage of the scripture. So we have it in many ways really to structure uh, our encounter with the word and our movement through the church year. There are two basic organizing principles for it that are relevant today. One is that there is a three-year cycle that we now work on. So that we are entering the year of Matthew. Following that, we will have the year of Mark. And then we'll have the year of Luke, just like we're finishing. And then we'll start over again with Matthew and Mark and Luke. And all that is is the focal gospel for that year of readings. That's the first organizing principle, this three-year cycle. Within each year, the lectionary is built around the six seasons of the church year. Who can name them? First, first season of the church year is? Advent. Second? Third? Epiphany. Fourth? Lent. Fifth? Easter. And the other half of the year is all Pentecost, right? So six seasons of the church year, we roll through it every year. And the first half of it is the first five seasons, and that's organized basically according to Jesus' life story. From anticipation of his birth through birth, revelation of who he is, Lent with the Passion and Suffering, Holy Week, Easter, uh, Resurrection, and 50 days of celebrating that. The other half of the church year is Pentecost, the season of the church or the season of the Holy Spirit, or the season of Jesus' teachings. And so we really roll into um, the, the gospel of the year in the strongest way in that second half. So in our year of Matthew, you will hear the gospel reading on Sunday morning from, gos from Matthew's gospel, primarily in Advent, in Epiphany, and in Pentecost. That's because Christmas is given over to Luke because he has the angels singing in the heavens and the manger in the stable and you know, all that Christmas stuff that we're so familiar with. So Christmas is mostly Luke. And then Lent and Easter are mostly from John's Gospel. You might have noticed in a three-year cycle, we only cover three of the Gospels. John's Gospel is there every year, dominantly in Easter, in, in a couple of the years in Lent. John fills in a bit for Mark because Mark's so short, so during the year of Mark we get a little more of John. And typically John is used for holidays. That's because John has long been used for holidays. Of course, John's gospel includes things like the seven I am sayings. I am the bread of life. I am the uh, uh, true vine. I am you know, living water. Um, all of those I am sayings and the kind of um, more theologically, spiritually articulated realities of uh, gospel proclamation are in John's gospel. So when we rise to the heights of our holiday celebrations, we tend to turn to John for some of that language. Okay, so what are we going to get in Advent, Epiphany, and Pentecost in the year of Matthew? Matthew. 
Well, Advent is four Sundays, of course. It runs uh, um, the four Sundays before Christmas, starting next Sunday, November 27th. Um, it'll go through the fourth Sunday in Advent, December 18th, and then it actually runs up through uh, Christmas Eve is still technically a part of, or Christmas Eve day is still technically a part of Advent. Um, and in Matthew, the focus on that, in that Advent season is on the guys. It's on John the Baptist, and it's on Joseph, Jesus' earthly father. Unlike Luke, who has the angel Gabriel coming to Mary, and she sings the Magnificat, etc., 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 and who shows Mary when Jesus is 12, and Jesus stays behind at the temple when the family goes back to uh, the north, and Mary is the one who talks to him about how distraught she and Joseph were. Unlike Luke, who loves Mary and spends a lot of time with Mary, Matthew's all about John the Baptist and Joseph. And so we get a couple of themes um, if you got the two handouts, I hope, um, the one that I'm following as an outline is the year of Matthew. The other one is some of the texts that I'll be referencing. So on the second Sunday in Advent, from Matthew 3, the focus is on John the Baptist, and Matthew says, John the Baptist, this is the one of whom Isaiah spoke when he said, a voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. So there's a measure of fulfillment here. On the third Sunday in Advent, when John the Baptist sends messengers to Jesus and says, are you the one who is to come or should we wait for another? The response is, um, tell John what you see. And it's that everything that Jesus is doing is fulfilling the promises of Israel's prophets. And then again, this is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger before you to prepare for the great and glorious day of the Lord from Malachi. It's a fulfillment pattern that is taking place here. On Advent 4 from Matthew 1, you shall, uh, Joseph is told that Mary is pregnant, but don't divorce her, so he doesn't. Um, and then the angel says, you are to call his name Jesus, because he'll save his people. That's a pun in Hebrew. And all this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the prophet, that his name shall be Emmanuel, which means God with us. Again, the fulfillment pattern. Matthew wants us to know that what he's telling us in the story of Jesus is what God has been working toward, what, that it's all consistent with what God has done in Israel for years and years and centuries. So one of the themes in Advent is this fulfillment. Another one is the urgency of things. But let me come back to that, um, because if you're looking at the text sheet, you'll see that this fulfillment pattern isn't only in Advent. There are actually 12 of these formulas in Matthew's Gospel that say this took place in order to fulfill what was said by, and then it's either the prophet or the name of a prophet, Matthew actually misquotes one of them and gets the wrong prophet's name attached to the quote. Um, eight of these fulfillment citations appear in our lectionary. So through the course of the year, primarily in the first part, you will hear eight of these fulfillment citations used. Um, two of them don't appear in the lectionary, and two others, the passage appears but we actually skip over the part that talks about the fulfillment for reasons I honestly can't explain. So again, this whole pattern of fulfillment. Take a look, if you will, at the back of your outline at the icons that I provided you. Is there a statue from the Lateran uh, Palace in Rome 
and then three different icons from different parts of the Eastern Orthodox tradition. What would you say is fairly consistent in the portrayal of Matthew, in this image of, of Matthew as it's been presented by icons and an artist? Yeah. He's reading a text. What text do you suppose he's reading? Exactly. He's reading Israel's scriptures. He's reading his Bible because Matthew knows that if he's going to understand and present Jesus properly, this has to be consistent with what God has done already with Israel and that's recorded in the scripture. So he's not just, if you look at those bottom two in particular, he's not just writing a text, which obviously as an evangelist, as a gospel writer, he would be writing a text, but he's also referring to a text. And that's the Old Testament, Israel scriptures, which he understands uh, Jesus as fulfilling. Um, what else do you notice that's consistent? Very serious looking. Yes, we will have no jokes in our Gospels. Um, yep, this is serious business. Okay, so he has a nimbus in the lower right-hand one, that gold medallion kind of halo behind his head. That's typically used to indicate sainthood. Actually, the one above it, if you look, there's also a nimbus because the gold of the nimbus breaks the line in the gold frame that's behind him. So in those two, there is the nimbus, um, not in the two on the left. No, he would appear not to be a peasant. Um, he looks rather well outfitted. Why might that be? The statue. Look under his, I think it's his right foot. Yep. Why would we present Matthew with a bag of coins under his feet? Right. Matthew is identified in the Gospels as when he is called to be a disciple, he is practicing the profession of tax collecting. And so the Matthew who becomes Jesus' disciple was a tax collector. And that gets reflected in the, um, in the statue. Interestingly, it doesn't get reflected in most of the Eastern Orthodox iconography. Also, the timing of Matthew's gospel, and this is true, most of you have probably heard me say this before, um, but the timing of the writing of the gospels makes it very unlikely that Jesus' disciples were themselves the authors. So, but this is not unusual in the ancient world. Um, the writer of Matthew, first of all, nobody claims that Matthew wrote it in the, in the manuscripts. It's the gospel according to Matthew. Well, that can mean I have Matthew's tradition that I'm writing down. And because all the evidence would indicate that we're at least 40 to 50 years after Jesus' death and resurrection before this gospel gets written. It's very unlikely that an adult disciple of Jesus would still have been alive in that culture. It, the life expectancies just didn't stretch that long as a rule. Um, but that it is the gospel according to Matthew, in other words, it comes out of a tradition that's connected to Matthew, that's what we can hold on to. Um, and so, to represent Matthew's heritage as a tax collector in a statue of him, perfectly fair, even if this probably is not written by the disciple. One other thing that's pretty consistent we haven't seen yet. How about that? Also in the one below, notice in the heavenly sphere at the top, we have another angel. And in fact, where the gospel writers are not represented by human forms, but only by symbols, it is often the case that 
um, Matthew is represented by an angel, or as here where there are human figures, is accompanied by an angel. Um, and that is precisely because right at the outset of the gospel, when uh, Mary turns out to be pregnant, an angel comes to Joseph. And so the story is initiated by an angel and this whole idea also that it is inspired. Now, the Gospels are all understood to be inspired and only Matthew is symbolized by the angel, uh, but that certainly is part of it. Yeah. Questions up to this point? They were collaborators <laughs> with the occupation. Um, so Rome occupied this land. Um, it was part of the Roman Empire, but to the locals, that was not uh, a big, you know, it, it wasn't that Rome had some right to an empire. It was that Rome had come in and occupied their country. And the taxes, of course, get paid to Rome. Typically, Rome employed locals who knew the community, who knew the economics of the community, who knew where the money bags and the bodies were buried. Um, Rome employed locals as tax collectors. And so a tax collector would be someone who had the kind of connections that could get the attention of the Romans. Here's somebody who could do it. Has a reputation for being honest enough that the Romans are not going to you know, fear subversion from that person and willing to collaborate with the Romans in order to collect the taxes. Um, it's a general profile we have. If you've noticed, um, all the gospel writers are pretty clear about the fact that tax collectors have a pretty bad rep in the community. Um, when, if you want to diss Jesus, you say he hangs out with tax collectors. And, uh, so, and, and that's kind of a good part of why. Often, actually, the way the system was structured was that they got their compensation, um, not as a salary from Rome, but rather as a percentage of uh, what they collected. And so Rome required this amount from the tax collector. The tax collector could collect whatever was possible, and the difference was what the tax collector lived on. One of the other themes in Advent is urgency. Um, when John the Baptist is preaching in uh, chapter 3, where we see John the Baptist preaching, um, it is, um, it, it, the, the message is, be alert. Um, the time is coming. Um, shape up. Uh, he preaches baptism for the repentance of sin. Um, but there's a real urgency about the message that you need to um, bring your life into line with what God expects and to do it now. And we'll see when we get to um, Pentecost that that gets picked up again more fully, but it's already present in Advent. And then probably the dominant theme from Matthew's Gospel in Advent is this uh, fulfillment citation about the Isaiah passage that his name will be called Emmanuel, which is named God with us. And that was originally spoken in, by Isaiah in Israel to talk about a, a timeline during which um, a threat to the nation from a couple of kings up north would continue but then end. And this was a date stamp. It was putting a, a, an end point on the threat that the kingdom was experiencing. And the way that Isaiah put that timeline in place was to say, see that young lady, she's pregnant. Um, by the time that child has any kind of awareness or discernment, you know, maybe 
two years old or three years old. By the time that child gets to that point, those two kings you're worried about now, they're going to be nothing. So her pregnancy and the child that would soon be two or three years old is the date stamp on the threat. And, there, and therefore, the name of the child is God with us because by that time, God will have resolved the problem and the kingdom will be safe again. That's what Isaiah meant. That's how it was used by Isaiah. The gospel writer picks it up in a whole different sense to say, no, God is with us in Jesus. God is with us in this child who is born. And so forget about the threat and the date stamp and the end of it. Matthew says we can use this understanding of God with us to say in the birth of this child, we know God is present under our circumstances and in our lifetime. Um, and so this theme that God is with us is uh, very strong in Matthew. Um, in Luke, the birth is much more about salvation. It's about peace. It's about reversals in history. Um, it's all those kinds of things. In Matthew, the birth is very much about God comes to be with us. In Mark, what's the birth about? Trick question, Mark doesn't have a birth story. <laughs> um, and in John, again, no birth story, but the word of God in which all things are created comes in the flesh to dwell among us. And it's, uh, it's about a redeemer who comes to save us from a, a depraved world. Um, but here, for Matthew, it is God with us. And we'll see particularly God teaching us. We move to that um, in Epiphany, um, where the focus is really on the Sermon on the Mount, and particularly the beginning of it. Uh, if you're back on the text page with me under Epiphany, which runs from January 6th to February 21st this year, the third Sunday in Epiphany, Jesus lived in came and moved from his hometown of Nazareth to Capernaum in order to fulfill that same prophecy in Isaiah 9 about, um, I'm sorry, the Emmanuel prophecy is Isaiah 7. This is Isaiah 9, where he fulfills that prophecy because he lives in the land of Zebulun and Naphtali. And so that locates him uh, in Capernaum as a fulfillment of what God has always seen uh, intended. But then the next three Sundays, Epiphany 4, 5, and 6, we read most of chapter 5 of Matthew, and that is the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. Chapters 5 through 7 is what we know as the Sermon on the Mount. In Epiphany 4, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And there are eight benedictions or beatitudes, blessings on people. Um, Ephesians, uh, Epiphany 5, you are salt. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. And don't think that I've come to do away with the Torah. Don't think that anything that has been written in this book of Israel's scripture will pass away until everything is fulfilled. Don't think that that's irrelevant to your life. Quite the contrary. Everything in it has to be fulfilled. And anybody who takes away one letter or even one stroke of a letter from it will be least in the kingdom of heaven. So this emphasis on we will be a community. If God is with us, that's not just always good news. You know, when your father gets home was not a saying I really liked hearing when I was growing up, right? Of course, it could be when your father gets home, then we'll go out for ice cream and see a movie, right? But when your father gets home could have a very different meaning. And so God with us, as much as it can be encouragement and comfort, can also be, watch out, be careful. This is a father, a heavenly father, who's told you how to live. And don't think that that has gone away or doesn't matter. It does. For Matthew, 
The Torah is the lifestyle of God's people, whether that's God's people in ancient Israel, contemporary Torah Jews, as we might call them, or his own community that worships the God of Israel through the figure of Jesus. And to underscore that, on Epiphany 6, we get the beginning of a whole series of um, teachings from Jesus where he quotes the Torah, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you, anyone who is Jimmy Carter, will, uh, no, anyone who even looks at a woman with lust in his heart has already committed adultery. You've heard it was said, you shall not commit murder. I say to you, anyone who deals with another person with anger has already committed murder. So, and this is, in Jewish tradition, this is what's called building a fence around the Torah. So if the point is, don't touch the burner on the stove, the fence that we build for our kids is, don't touch the stove at all, right? There's nothing inherently wrong with touching the stove. The problem is if you touch the burner, but if you build the fence around it, then there's no way they're going to touch the burner. And similarly, when Jesus says, it says don't commit murder, but I say to you, don't even be angry, obviously, if you're, if you're pulling yourself back and challenging yourself and trying to get control of yourself when you feel that anger, you're never going to get to murder. That's the whole point. And it's a, it's a tried and true method within rabbinic teaching um, to build this fence around the Torah so that what is really essential is carefully, carefully observed. This is what we get in Epiphany from Matthew. Pentecost is half of the church year, half of the church year, and it is where each of the three years we really focus most centrally on the teaching of Jesus. It's also been called the time of the church. The festival of Pentecost, of course, refers to the Pentecost narrated in the second chapter of Acts, where the Holy Spirit comes on the believers in Jerusalem and they are anointed with the Holy Spirit, and it's often called the birthday of the church. Um, so um, the season of Pentecost focuses on um, no longer the life of Jesus, as the first five seasons have, but now Jesus' teachings. And in Matthew, it focuses particularly on teachings that Matthew doesn't share with Mark or Luke, because Matthew shares a lot with Mark and Luke. Matthew used Mark for his basic structure. Um, he shared a source with Luke, so they have a lot of material that's in common. But in the lectionary, at least half of what we have in Pentecost is material that we only hear in Matthew. And here there's a balance. On the one hand, it's alert readiness for judgment going back to that urgency that was signaled in Advent. The Lord is coming. There will be judgment with that. You need to be ready for it. You don't know when it will be. And on the other hand, in a way that the other Gospels don't do as explicitly, there is provision for an organized communal life while you are waiting for that moment that will come. Um, let's talk about the urgency first. Again, on the source sheet in Pentecost, uh, right in the middle of it, 16th and 17th Sundays. Um, the, this is uh, Matthew 13, which is a whole chapter of parables, and these are the parables of the kingdom of heaven. It's like a field with both wheat and weeds. Leave it until the harvest. The harvest is the critical moment when things will be separated out. It's like a treasure hidden in a field. Sell everything to buy it. It's like a pearl of great price. Sell everything to buy it. It's like a net with good and bad fish. They'll be sorted out in the end. This image that there will come a time when all will be sorted out uh, in the kingdom of heaven uh, comes through very clearly 
And then toward the end of the season, Pentecost 24, and a year from today, the reign of Christ, we're in Matthew 25, which is uh, Matthew's vision of the future. And it is, the kingdom of heaven will be like this. It'll be like 10 bridesmaids. Familiar with this one? 10 bridesmaids going to the wedding party. They all bring their lamps, their oil lamps. And five of them bring extra oil, and five of them don't. Five of them are prepared for that coming of the bridegroom, and five of them aren't. And five of them get into the party when the bridegroom comes. The other five are out trying to find more oil because they didn't bring it, and the bridegroom comes and the door is closed and they don't get in. The urgency, the crucial aspect of when the, when the bridegroom comes, when the kingdom is inaugurated in its fullness, you need to be ready. And on reign of Christ, this human one, son of man, as it's sometimes translated, will come in glory and sit in judgment with the angels and there will be sheep on one side and goats on the other side. And the sheep are those who fed and clothed and visited the least of these, my brothers and sisters. And the goats are the ones who did not feed and clothe and visit the least of these, my brothers and sisters. These are welcomed into the kingdom. These are banished into the outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. The urgency of being prepared for that moment, it couldn't be any clearer. And yet, at the same time, Matthew is the only gospel to actually use the word church. The only gospel to use the word church. Luke uses it in his second volume, the book of Acts. But in the gospel itself, only Matthew uses the word church. In chapter 16, he says to Peter, after Peter says, you are, you know, who do people say that I am? Maybe you're Jeremiah, maybe you're one of the prophets, maybe you're John the Baptist, come back to life. Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, and you, Cephas, will be named Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church. First time in any of the gospels that we see that word church. And then two chapters later, there are provisions for what happens if somebody within the church, within the community, sins, and how do you approach that person? There's a whole process for how you go through it, first one-on-one, -on -one, then you bring two or three, then you take them to the elders. The last thing you do is go to the courts. Um, but there again, it's if a member of the church sins against you. So while individually the emphasis is on having your life in order in accordance with this Torah as Jesus teaches it. At the same time, there's a provision for an ongoing life in the church which Matthew already knows and speaks to as the, the pattern of the community's life while we are waiting. This is unlike Mark for whom it's all about how you respond to the news of the resurrection um, and, and the urgency of that. And everything in Mark is now, 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 now. Uh, but Mark lived at the point at which who, which part of the community you were going to go with in a crisis moment was immediately upon them. And that's reflected in how Jesus' message is presented in Mark's gospel Matthew clearly represents a time when there are organized communities and when the, while the, you don't know when Jesus is coming and you have to be ready individually, and yet there's going to be enough time. We have an organization. We have a community. It has structures, and um, that is how uh, we will live. The last thing that I would share with you about this is that we've, I've mentioned the parables in Matthew 13 and the image of the future in Matthew, actually chapters 24 and 25. 
Um, there's also a set of instructions to missionaries about how they are to take the word out into the world. That's a long speech in chapter 10. Um, and there's also a long speech in chapter 18. Those five long speeches in many ways organize the gospel of Matthew between a birth story and a passion story. And those five long preachings, sermons, starting with the Sermon on the Mount, have been likened to the five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the Torah. So that Matthew, in structuring the book, not only portrays Jesus as an interpreter and a giver of the lifestyle you live because God has created you and expects you to live a certain way, but even in the structure of the book says, oh, you know those five books of the Torah that came down from Sinai? Well, when Jesus was on the mountain and started with his Sermon on the Mount, that was only the first of five. And here are his five books of instruction paralleling the Torah that is being fulfilled and now carried forward, being filled more fully, in a sense, by what we've learned from Jesus. So what should we expect of Matthew this year? The God of Israel continues faithfully to lead the community and the world toward judgment and the kingdom of God, God's rule, with Jesus as the teacher, the model, the ultimate judge, in a sense, as the community's Moses. That's where we'll be going. See it in Advent. We'll go to Luke for Christmas. We'll be back to Matthew and Epiphany. We'll have that long stretch of Lent and Easter when we hang out with John's Gospel. But come next June, get ready this is the Matthew that you're going to be meeting in church week by week. Questions, thoughts, reflections? Art's question is uh, about the word immediately, which um, is just littered across the pages of Mark's gospel. Jesus did this, and immediately this happened. This happened, and immediately Jesus responded. Something happened, and immediately they went out. Um, this immediately adverb is there all over Mark's gospel. Um, and it's, it's some of that sense of the crisis that Mark's community is facing. Um, I can't say Matthew never has the word. I haven't, looked, I haven't checked it, but it certainly is not thematic in Matthew the way that it is in Mark. So literally the word church, ecclesia, if you know the word ecclesiastical, um, that's actually church. Ecclesiastical means it's churchy. Um, it's related to the church. And it's built out of the Greek word ecclesia, which, means, which is the word we're talking, you're talking about. And that literally means those who are called out. They're called out. They're called out from the community. They're called out from the mass of humanity to be this community that is called out. Um, that language is not used in the Jewish community about their own gatherings, but a synagogue is an English version of synagogue, and that means to draw together. So whether you're talking about calling people out of the mass or whether you're talking about drawing people together from the mass, it's really very much the same imagery that these are communities that respond to a call. And the call is the call of God to be God's people in the world and to witness to who God is, not only verbally, but with your whole life. And that's what it is to be either called out or drawn together. Please. Please. 
Great question. One author or multiple authors of Matthew? The whole book holds together well enough that it's almost, it, it's very unlikely that there was not at least a final editor who said, okay, this is the way it's going to go, beginning to end. But, we know that along the way, there were at least three different sources that were incorporated into the story. Mark's gospel gives the overall plot line and stru narrative structure to it. Luke and Matthew share a source that was primarily about Jesus' teachings and sayings and parables. Didn't have much narrative at all. Um, it, it was just like... Uh, uh, poor Richard's Almanac, it was the collection of sayings, you know, sayings of Chairman Mao, I don't know. Um, but but they, Luke and Matthew shared a source that had that in it. And then there's material that Matthew's community just has. And that's a lot of what we get here. Um, so we know at least that there are these three different sources from which the gospel is assembled. How many hands were actually involved in doing that um, nobody's come, is, how many hands were involved, we're not sure. Nobody's come up with a plausible thesis of, well, here's an earlier edition of Matthew, which clearly was reworked. We can see that in Jeremiah, um, where there was an earlier edition and then there's a later edition. Um, we don't see that sort of thing in Matthew. And we do see the coherence that says, somebody put this together from beginning to end, as a final editor. Okay, well, thank you very much.